Welcome to Clear Eyes, Full Hearts, a podcast presentation of Cadence 13 in association with Black Barrel Media and Ritual Productions. This is an episode-by-episode look at the award-winning TV show Friday Night Lights, created by Peter Berg. I'm Stacey Orsfano. I played Mindy Collette Riggins. And I'm Derek Phillips, and I played Billy Riggins. Our assumption is that you, our listeners, have already watched the show. But if you haven't already, go watch Friday Night Lights, which is currently streaming on Netflix and Peacock TV, because there will be spoilers in our podcast. Guys, we got merch. That's right, baby. We've got merchandise. We've got uh, hoodies. We've got hats. We've got T-shirts. So head on over to ClearEyesFullHeartsPod.com. Once again, that's ClearEyesFullHeartsPod.com. And every few weeks, we'll do an audience participation episode just to answer your questions. So email us what you want to know at ClearEyesFullHeartsPod at gmail.com. Today, we are talking about season one, episode 10. It's different for girls. It was written by Andy Miller and directed by Stephen K. This is our NBC synopsis. As the cheer team prepares for the championship classic, Lila becomes the victim of brutal harassment over her affair with Tim. Coach Taylor tries to keep Julie and Matt apart. Jason adjusts to life at home and smash falls for the preacher's daughter. We have another amazing guest with us today, Catherine Willis, who played Jason Street's mom, Joanne. And believe it or not, this is the first time she's talked about Friday Night Lights in depth. So you're definitely going to hear stories you've never heard before. Let's get to the highlights of this episode. And then we'll talk to Catherine Willis in the back half of the show. I'm going to say I'm like 95% sure that I had a scene in this episode that was cut. But for the life of me, I could never tell you what it was. I just know it was me and Annie. Huh. I wonder. Well, now you've got me like wondering what scene that was. It was obviously at, not at all important to the storyline. Apparently. <laughs> I don't remember it at <laughs> all. I mean, right when we jump into this episode, the girls in this episode are brutal to Lila. Not just the girls, the boys too. It is that double standard that that unfortunately exists for women whenever there's a situation where they've had sex or or been unfaithful or whatever. It's the name of this episode. It's different for girls. It's different for girls. I know. I was thinking that the guys, the guys beat up Regan's truck really badly and then they were cool. They were like, hey, bro, welcome back to the team. But this is not the same for girls. I can't fathom being in junior high or high school now with social media. it, It terrifies me to even think about, oh, I don't, I Don't know how you do it. This episode is hard to watch. This one was a ride, a big, big ride. But starting off a very, very sweet scene, Julie and Matt talking about their very new relationship. And Julie says that her dad is all bark and no bite. And I was just thinking, I absolutely don't think that's true. I think that coach thinks he's a lot tougher than he is. But (laughs) I mean, he's trying his best in this episode to to lay the the ground rules, but he keeps getting foiled at every stretch. I just also, the two of them together, they are so freaking cute. They really are. I love their chemistry on this show. And every scene, every time that they have a scene together, I just, it makes me smile. And you need it sometimes because we've got all this heavy Jason Lila drama in this episode. We see Jason Street coming home for the first time. And all I could think was, The last time he was in his own house, the place he's been his entire life, his life was completely normal and everything was good and going the way it's supposed to be. And now he has this homecoming and his life is completely turned around and different. Yeah. And this gigantic elephant in the room, which is him being paralyzed. And and essentially, Catherine Willis does such a wonderful job in this this episode of trying to create some form of normalcy when he comes Mm -hmm. home. But as I said before, I mean, the giant elephant in the room is that nothing is ever going to be normal again for this kid. Every new thing that they show us about Street, like the trials that he's going to go through, add more to the realization of it. But I was just thinking about going home to the place that's supposed to be your your safety, your home, and you can't even go to your old room because it's upstairs. So now you're downstairs stuck in the Mm -hmm. guest bathroom. Everything about this new life is so hard for this, what, 16, 17-year-old boy. It is just, it is a lot. Uh, but then we move on to a scene that's got a little bit more levity to it when Julie's in the car with her mom and dad and uh, they're listening to this slammy, Slam and Sammy meet again on the radio and Julie says, can we turn this down? And they have a little bit of a tiff and Julie says, ah, I just want my own car. 
Kyle and Tammy both laugh and say, dream on, kid. They also talk about one of our favorite moments in this, Stacey, when they when they refer to Landry as Lance. And they both call him Lance. And Julie's just like, Ugh, get me out of this car. You know, she's tag team Do on you Julie. know that feeling too, that just teenager feeling where you're just your parent, you're so over your parents. You're just like, just oh, give 100%. me some freedom. You guys are so embarrassing. 100%. I have to apologize to my parents every time I see them because I was such a schmuck back then. I do the same thing to my mom. I was like, I'm so, I'm so, I was so mean. I'm so sorry. Yeah. And then we have another great scene with Smash. We are actually introduced to a brand new character on the show, Waverly, who is played by the amazing Asha Davis. But Smash's first line to her is he says, talk to the Smash. And so, you know what? I have decided that from this point on, Stacy, I'm going mm-hmm. to refer to myself as the Derek. I promise you, mm-hmm. I will quit the podcast. Well, get ready, because from this point on, I will be referred to as the Derek and the Derek only. <laughs> So the Derek, when he was watching this, noticed oh, that, uh, that Waverly, <laughs> so Waverly and Smash are having this conversation. It turns out Waverly is actually the preacher's daughter, the preacher that we've at, at yes. Smash's church. So of course, I mean, Smash, he, this whole episode, he seems to just be putting his foot in his mouth, as we'll see with the next scene, right? There's a, there's a, minute, a moment too, when I was like, wait, I know we've seen, we've seen that character before. Oh, that's his preacher from his church. Oh, that's yes. his daughter. This is layers of goodness then he oh gosh smash in the locker room talking just just even though i hate the term but locker room talk with the boys talks to matt about even it's getting mangway's skin call to say this right now he talks about the v chip about julie and matt's like don't please don't please don't and coach is standing right behind him and heard all of it i actually wanted to crawl under my couch and die I'm not going to lie. The Derek felt uncomfortable when he watched that as well. I mean, the Derek was blushing, even though the Derek wasn't even there in that scene when it actually happened. But he felt guilty, the Derek. This whole episode with Smash, as I said before, is just a series of him putting his foot in his mouth. And I love seeing this kind of aspect of Smash because he's such a confident guy that it's kind of great to see him, you know, on edge. I I did. I have seen this episode before because the reason I remember this scene was cut is I had a tiny little watch party with like two of my friends, Chris and Nick. And we were like watching and waiting for my scene to come up. And I was like, oh, wait, guys, I think maybe it is not in the scene. But I did remember this scene happening and me going, wait, that looks like. That looks like Maggie Wheeler. No way, that's Maggie Wheeler. I love Maggie Wheeler. Guess what? It is Maggie Wheeler playing the teacher, aka Janice from Friends. She's one of my one of my favorite actresses. I I adore her. And just is this the? I think this might be the last time we see her. I think it's the only scene that she was in, which leads me to believe that she booked some other job or or something because you don't bring in an actress with that kind of clout and have them do one scene. Usually. I mean, it usually doesn't play out that way. So maybe some stuff that she was in got cut. Mm -hmm. But once again, for those of you who who don't know, because I mean, she's that good of an actress that you might not recognize it, but she's Janice from Friends, Mm -hmm. as Stacey said. But Janice is (laughs) Chandler Bing. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my God. Oh my God. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Who's spectacular on Friends. So it is kind of weird to see her grounded in playing a normal yeah. character. I would have liked to have seen what else she would have done with this teacher. I'm a little, I'm a little upset. Yeah, there's no way because she definitely flew in from LA to do this. Sometimes that happens on the show. Uh, they probably had a, uh, an arc for her character planned and then she got another job and then see you later. Uh, that happens a lot and it will happen going forward. That's right, kids. That's showbiz. But we'll point those moments out because there are a couple of times on this show where that happens, where you know that they brought in a character, that character supposedly had a bigger arc and then that character is no longer on the show. One thing that was really kind of cool about this scene is watching Waverly because she is kind of wise beyond her years when you talk about uh, the rest of the kids on this show. She even says at one point that monogamy is a state of higher evolution, which is a pretty adult concept. I did want to break in right here in my watching to only, this isn't like a note, this isn't a behind the scenes anything. This is just shout out to Connie Burton's hair. She's got great hair. (laughs) Moving on. Tyra sees that Riggins actually loves Lila. This wasn't just a, or a hormonal teenage mess up, but he's actually in love with Lila. This has happened to me in my life. Oh, I think Somebody I was seeing, and it is so heartbreaking. It's awful to watch because at some point in your life, that will have happened to you. And it is a, <sighs> yeah. 
Trish. Oof, it's a punch right to the gut. I do have to say respect to this dad coming into the car dealership and telling Buddy straight to his face. He's like, yeah, my daughter put some terrible things about Lila on the internet. You need to see it. And then Buddy seeing that stuff and breaking down. I love it when we see his softness. I love those those. Just tiny little moments. And Brad's, I love seeing this side of Buddy Garrity. Because as I mm-hmm. said, in the beginning, he's, he's, we look at him as kind of a one note Johnny. And Brad Leland does such a wonderful job of uh, showing that he's a concerned father. So Mr. and Mrs. Street have talked before about they're bringing a lawyer over to the house. And I didn't understand it at first either. I think Jason feels the same way I did. Like, okay, we can talk to a lawyer. He finally admits, he's like, I, I thought, we were maybe going to talk about suing the school, but it seems like you guys maybe want to sue coach. And he's like, I, I want no part of that. That's not what this is about. Yeah. This, this lawsuit has now taken a massive curve. We didn't see this coming. And yeah, Jason is definitely not, not for it. But once again, we move on to another scene uh, with a little bit more levity. Number one, Matt shows up at the house unannounced to come watch a TV with, with Julie and, and coach and Tammy are just like, are you out of your mind? Not a chance. And so Coach decides he's going to walk in there and bust it up. He's had enough of the two of them being on the couch. And Tammy's like, don't do it. Coach walks out there, despite Tammy's protestations, and he says, you know, hey, you got to go. And then Tammy walks out, and she's like, what are you doing? And he's like, she's like, he's like, they had a blanket. (laughs) And she goes, you're an idiot. I love that scene. It's just, they had a blanket. Like, that was... That's it. That's his. That's his line in the sand. They yeah. were under a blanket. Yeah. They had, and they weren't even really under it. You know no, what I mean? They were. Just, they weren't even like that cuddled up. I love that they were watching The Office too. Just a little, little NBC shout out makes me very happy. <laughs> I might have a new favorite moment of the show. I had completely forgotten about this. About the the football players coming out in cheer costumes and doing a cheer. I had completely forgotten about it, and I love that Riggins is the only one that doesn't need a wig because he can just put his hair in pigtails. And it was, I, I died laughing. Now we used to do that when I was in high school too, but I wonder if that's something that still exists in high schools today. You know what I mean? Do they still do that? Like, yeah, I hear you. It might be a weird, a weird gray area. We definitely did it too. The girls, the girls played a football game and the boys were the, yeah, we had like a powder puff football game yeah, powder puff. with the girls. And yeah. then the boys would all be the cheerleaders with obnoxiously huge like we would have obnoxiously large breasts put yeah, in and there. Yeah, butts and like balloons wigs. and butts. Yeah, and wigs and just, yeah. Nobody got any schoolwork done that day. No, no. <laughs> oh, and then we cut to a scene with uh, Tammy and Lila. And this scene, I just thought, personally, was a, just a really beautiful scene. And it's also an interesting scene because it kind of juxtaposes the way that Tammy relates with her students and the way that Lila's mom relates with her. And it just shows that Tammy is a listener. She's there. She's not judging. She has no advice necessarily. She's just there to listen and be an ear. Whereas Lila's mom is there immediately to give advice and say, hey, you can learn from your mistake and know God's mercy. But I just thought it was a really beautiful scene between the two of them. I love it. There's, oh, I remember, I remember this scene. This one killed me when I saw it the first time. It kills me now. There's that moment when Lila is over at Street's house and they're, they're hanging out outside. And Street grabs her hand and puts his hand on his face while he's telling her, I can't. It is, it's so simple. And it's, there's so much power behind what he's saying and the actions that he's doing while he's doing it. I think it's beautiful and crushing. Well, yeah. I mean, he's basically in a nutshell saying that like, is, I love you. I'm in love with you, but I can no longer do this to myself and I can't be with you. But you have that, you want that one last minute that one last minute of physical contact with somebody that you're sure you're not going to have ever again. Oh man. And this is another one of my favorite scenes. Coach is in a rush. They're going to the cheerleading tournament and coach in his, in his ultimate wisdom thought it would be a good idea to put the kibosh on Matt and Julie. And he thought he could do this by loading Matt down with game tape to watch over the weekend after he had his, his Matt chat as he was calling it. And it of course totally backfires because Julie is now helping Matt take notes on the game tape. And Connie says, or Tammy says at one point, at the end of the conversation. Oh, and by the way, she wants you to go right strong ISO when you're in the nickel package. So now Julie's like this football savant. It's really just a, a great moment. I don't know what any of those words mean. Well, technically, I think she would mean strong right ISO, but it's neither here nor there. There was a little moment of of pride on Coach's face too. And he was like, oh, oh, 
Julie said that? Uh, I can imagine a, a man who's been, you know, surrounded by women for the last 15, 16 years of his life now has someone who his daughter's taken an interest in football. And she's been listening this whole time, just like not, not, not showing that she's been listening. Okay. I have to tell you, if I had missed practices and missed pep rally and then showed up late for cheer comp, there's no way they're letting me on the mat. My butt would have been booted out of there so fast, but I will tell you it made for a very lovely scene. I was very excited to see Lila doing what she loves. But I do like that the coach, the, the cheerleading coach saw kind of what was going on with Lila and knew what was going on and kind of gave her a little bit of a hall pass here because of that. Or at least that's that's kind of how I saw it. I, I actually like that take on it. I'm also right there with you. If I'd have shown up like 20 minutes late for a football game, I think I'd have been riding the pine. But then we see there's a close up on Lila's face and she looks up at the stands and gives a smirk. And then the camera goes to Riggins. And so we think, oh, she's smiling at Riggins. And then you pull back. And Jason Street is sitting right behind him and she's smiling at Street. And again, I got those FNL goosebumps. <laughs> and it's also a scene that, that Derek liked because it looks like maybe there's uh, a potential for, for a little reunion here with uh, Street and Lila. Oh, the Derek likes it? That's right. Oh, God. Okay. The Derek <laughs> and I are going to stop talking now so that we can talk to Catherine Mills because she's far more interesting than either of us are. So stick around. All right, everyone, we are here with the amazingly talented Catherine Willis, who played Joanne Street, a.k.a. Jason Street's mom. You may also recognize her from her work on Amazon's Tell Me Your Secrets, Pierce Brosnan's The Sun, The Blacklist, Queen of the South, The Leftovers, Resurrection, Deliverance Road, The Lying Game, the film Friday Night Lights, which I think you guys know, and the soon-to-be-released teeny tiny little film that seems to be getting a lot of buzz called Killers of the Flower Moon, starring up-and-coming actors Leonardo DiCaprio and Robert De Niro. It's also directed by a newbie director that's getting a lot of buzz. His name is Martin. Uh, how am I? Am I saying this properly? Scorke- Scorkezi. Scors- Scors- Scorkezi. <laughs> how do you pronounce it, Catherine? Scorsese. Scorsese. Ooh, very, what an interesting name. So, hey, Catherine. Hi, friends. Welcome to our show. Hi, Cat. It just makes me beyond thrilled to hear your voices. Same. Thank you so much for doing the show with us. So I'm, I'm going to go ahead and jump right into it and ask you, what was your Friday Night Lights audition experience like? And, and I, I'd like to hear both the, the film version and yeah. I don't even know, did you audition for the TV show as well? So the TV the version was exactly the same as the film version. Peter Berg was in the room. In the film mm-hmm. version, I actually auditioned in the room with another actress and he threw stuff out and we improv I remember clearly the other actress got really thrown and choked mm. and that was hard to witness. Oh, yay. Yeah. Interesting for the TV audition. When we were shooting the pilot, usually series regulars on new TV shows, their agents from New York and LA will come and visit set. It's kind of a, a protocol thing that they do. And one of the cast members' agent approached me and he said, I had a lot of my actors audition for your role, for Joanne Street. And during this time, it was less common for people outside of New York and LA to book a network TV show. So there was kind of this look like, how the hell did you get this? Who are you? Yeah. Where do you live? You live in Austin? And I was like, yeah, the best person got the job. Damn straight. What I wanted to tell him was I never auditioned for Joanne Street. That was a gimme. I actually auditioned for Tam Taylor. <gasps> Shut up. I did not know that. I don't think I've ever told anyone. Wow. I didn't know that. Yeah, they were in the middle of negotiations with Connie. I think it's pretty common that Connie didn't want to redo what she did in the movie. She wanted to be a more active mm-hmm. role than the silent supportive wife on the sidelines and she and let me just say it all worked out exactly as it should because she and Kyle are in my opinion the most iconic married couple that has ever been yeah. captured in TV or film. Yeah. But yeah, they were she was really unclear about whether she wanted to do the show or not. So they were mm-hmm. auditioning folks. And when things worked out for Connie, they offered me Mama Street. 
and I was happy to yeah. take it. So that's awesome. Mm-hmm. That was my audition experience. I did not know that. I've never told anyone. And it's the first TV I've ever done. Me too. You're such a pro though. I was just mm-hmm. like all of these these people that have been doing TV and stuff forever. How much did you know about your story with your son going into it? Like it's for the pilot, especially. Very little. I mean, it was script by script. As a matter of fact, if there's something that I, I know now that I wish I would have known then, because it was my first time doing TV and I didn't really know the protocol and that everybody was kind of in it together. Nobody really knew what they were doing. I was like, I'm just going to hang back and I'm going to, I'm going to have people invite me into the inner circle because I don't want to overstep. And what I wish I would have done was be a little more proactive with regard to Scott and nurturing our relationship and pulling him aside and going, hey, what's happening with the story? Yeah. Yeah. Because I would have to read the script to find out. If we're not necessarily in every episode, we don't read the other scripts. So it's like, I don't know what happened in the past two weeks, but I'm going to sit at this dinner table and talk to you now. Yeah. Here we go. Yeah, that's exactly right. And then try to piece together the hair and makeup trailer is a great resource for information. Going, Okay. Can you fill in the blanks? Yeah. They have all the info. Wardrobe also. No, I found out more times on different television shows that I'm going to be in another episode because they're like, oh, let's go ahead and get you fitted for episode eight as well. And you're like, oh, absolutely. I'm in episode eight. I did not know that. Great. Thank you. Thank you for telling me I have a job. There was one movie that I'm still a little heartsick that I was approached about during season one. And I, they were, they said, we need you for this block of time. And I was like, I can't guarantee that I'm available. And Friday night fights takes precedence. So if they call, I'm going. And I have to say, there's been, there were a couple of episodes where I didn't even get a script until I showed up on my trailer at base camp to film that day. So you could read the script really fast and try to get a feel for it. And thank goodness, I know you guys have probably talked about this already, but thank goodness they weren't sticklers on dialogue. Like we could yeah. Right. Kind of change things however we wanted. And people all the time talk about how is this, you know, how is it so natural? How did you guys capture that? It's because we weren't obligated to any set. I mean, and I've been, and I know you guys have too, been on sets where you have to get every and and the and comma yeah. or s- script supervisors coming up to you going, so we missed this word. It's a they instead of an and. And the script supervisor, for those of you out there that don't know, the script supervisor is the one that just kind of makes sure you guys are staying on point, making sure that you're hitting your marks, that you're saying the lines the way it's supposed to be or the way it was written by the actual writer. So what what would you say the big difference between shooting the film and shooting the television show was? I shot on the film the very first day of the film. And it was, interestingly, Uh it was a dinner scene with Brad and Connie. I was, all of my dialogue was to Billy Bob Thornton. So it's one of those things yeah. where it was a massive film. It was Universal Studios. Brian Grazer was there. So the, there was a reporter from GQ interviewing Billy Bob Thornton. So the vibe was yeah. totally different. This was a very Hollywood wow. production. Whereas the TV show, we definitely shot the pilot like a movie. And I know Pete got mm-hmm. enough footage that he easily could have made the pilot into a movie. But it, it very much felt like we were in, all in it together. In that first episode, when you're in the hospital with Jason, there's no words, but the expression on your face is saying so much. So I was going to ask yeah. you, oh, yeah. how did you prep for that moment? I just got goosebumps with you asking me that. I love that we're talking about this because these are conversations no one, like these are questions no one's ever asked me. And I'm so excited to share it. We shot in a real hospital. The scene where they're doing surgery on Jason, it was a real surgeon. Mm. So you could, walking into that space, it didn't take any imagination to wonder, how would this feel? And my reaction in that scene where Coach walks in and Jason's in the helmet Mm -hmm. and he puts his, like, that was a very real moment for me. Absolutely. That's where like people are, people are sick and people die. And there's a smell in a hospital that just feels medical. You're like, this is serious right now. Yeah. What's happening? There's that smell. 
That smell is so specific. I hope you're okay with me asking this. Like there were uh, a lot of Friday Night Lights fans probably don't know this, but you had a cancer scare during the first season yeah. of shooting and you had surgery during Christmas break of 2006. And then literally like two or three weeks later, we're back on set shooting. And I remember having this conversation yeah. with you because you had shown me your scar. They just took the staples out just before, like literally before I came to shoot my episode, I had, so to fill everyone in, it was a random thing. Went to the doctor because I live in Austin and I have allergies and that's a thing if you live in Austin. And he looked at me and he was like, you have a bump on your neck where your thyroid is. He's like, have you ever noticed that? I was like, no. And he was like, no big deal. We'll do a needle biopsy. I'm sure it's nothing. So he does the needle biopsy. I go about my life. Three months later, I think to myself, oh my God, I never heard from that doctor about that needle biopsy. I wonder what, I, I'm sure it's nothing. I would have heard from him. I called the office there, like left a message. Uh, at the time I was also going through a divorce. So they had left a message with my now ex-husband and he had not passed the message along to me. Oof. Now it wasn't malicious. It was just, we were both going through a lot. It was the end of a, of a relationship. And they're like, we need you to come in a bit immediately as soon as I came in I signed they made me sign this release saying they're not viable because they haven't been able to get in touch with me the doctor said uh we got the test results it's not definitively cancer but it's not not cancer it's this these type of cells that are somewhere in between you need to have your thyroid removed immediately and I was like whoa whoa, whoa. I was like there is there is nothing wrong with me. Wow. And he said, and I was like, if this is your wife, your daughter, he was like, I would get it out. So I went to three other doctors. I had three other second opinions. They ended up finding three tumors instead of one. And the whole time I would make a, a surgery appointment and then would have an episode. And the whole time I just didn't, it didn't feel like, I don't think there's anything wrong with you. But everyone kept on saying, listen, this is cancer. Thyroid is so close to your lymph nodes. It'll spread through your whole body. You don't want to, you want to be around for your kids, don't you? And then you don't want to deal with type four cancer, like terminal cancer, do you? So I went back and forth. I canceled surgery three times. And then I went through with it during Christmas break, went back on set. I had a fresh scar that there were staples all the way across the base of my neck and it took a year I what was terrifying was I went back and I couldn't remember one line and I'm the type of person that can read a script one maybe a scene two times and I've got it I couldn't retain anything and my uh, anesthesia will do that anesthesia and my thyroid meds were way off and it took a year. I had to change doctors and advocate for myself. Oh, mom, I, I didn't have cancer, which was great. But then it took like a year for me to go back and forth. The doctors going, I don't feel right. And then going, well, this one lab we're doing looks fine. And I was like, well, are there other labs? And they're like, no, we don't do other labs. We just do this one very specific test. And then I ended up going to another doctor. The other doctor was like, oh my God, not to like, get too technical about it. But he was like, your one thyroid level is so bad. You should have been in a hospital. And I was like, can we do something about that? Jesus. Yeah, it was bad. But oh, I was a single mom and you're tired <laughs> and you can't remember stuff because you're going through stuff. But it took like a year and that was terrifying because I remember Mark Nutter who played Mitchell Street, Jason's street da street's dad, just coming up to me going, I've never seen you like this. Are you okay? And that's when I really panicked. Like him being scared for me. Yeah. Really, really was scared. But it all worked out. In episode 10, uh, it's when uh, Jason moves back into the house with you guys. You In this scene, you've got this nervous energy. What was it like shooting those scenes? And did you know going into it that you and Mark were going to wind up suing no, Coach? No, we didn't. I remember that 
the overarching feeling, I just really wanted everything to be perfect for him. Like I couldn't take away this life-changing event that devastated our family. And as his parent, I was trying to do everything I could to make him feel comfortable. One of my favorite scenes that you ever had on the show, and it's a little teeny scene, is you at the convenience mm-hmm. store and you bump into Tim. It's on my demo reel. That's one of my favorite scenes, too. It's such a, an understated, subtle little moment that you have with him, and we get across a lifetime that you guys have had together. Yeah, he's been over at your house for years. Since he was a little kid, and you knew that this kid didn't have the best upbringing, and you were a mother to him, basically. And there's a moment where his hair kind of is hanging down in front of his face, and you're asking him, are you eating okay? Is everything okay? And you slowly put, you, you push, brush the hair back from his face. And it's such a subtle movement, but it's a motherly movement. It's the kind of thing yeah. that you would only do to someone that you've had that kind of relationship with, which... And I'm going to keep, I'm going to stop talking here in a second and let you talk about it. But it is one of those things as a guest star, it's very difficult to come onto a show and have that kind of comfort level with the person that you're working with. Because the reality is, and most people don't know this, you probably met Taylor that day. Or if you had met him before, it was in, in passing. So to establish that kind of relationship in that kind of quick moment as an actor to actor, I'm like, wow. Oh my God. You guys, thank you for that. First of all, that scene, the final scene that aired, they did a shooting rehearsal. And it was the first time we ran through the scene. And it was early wow. on in the show. I think that was episode two. So we had shot the pilot. And the pilot was a whole, its own thing. And then episode two, like, we did the shooting rehearsal. Mm-hmm. And then they are like, great, we got it. Moving on. And I was like, wait a sec, wait. And I literally went to the camera operator. I went to Heather Page and I was like, did we, did we really get it? Or are they just saying we got it? Because I don't, I wasn't, there was other stuff. Like that was a rehearsal. We were just rehearsing the lines. And she's like, no, it looks great. We're moving on. So I guess the last thing I wanted to talk to you about, do you have anything that you've just worked on or anything that you're, that you've finished working on that you'd like to talk about? Is there anything you want to plug? I know I want to talk about something in particular that we spoke about earlier, which is Killers of the Flower Moon. I don't know what you can or can't say about it. I'm imagining not much. I mean, they haven't had me sign any NDA, so I can talk as much as like I can talk about it. I've been in Oklahoma for the last four months. I've been shooting this Scorsese movie with Robert De Niro and Leonardo DiCaprio. I just saw Jesse Clemens last week. He's playing one of the leads as well. Yay. Awesome. And this is what I will tell you. People think that our job is really glamorous, right? There was this terrible ice storm in Austin in February of this year. All the power went out. Water went out. I was rat- had been rationing water for three days. My power was going on and off. I get this audition through my cell phone when I had intermittent power and internet. And it was for the next day. And I wrote back to my agent, do we really need to do this this week? <laughs> if I can push a week, I'd really appreciate it. She's like, well, they asked for you. I would really suggest that you do. And I looked at the audition. It was one line on a page with nothing else. I had what I thought was the worst audition of my life. So bad. <laughs> that in my mind, I was like, this is a clear message from the universe that I need to do something else. And I did this audition, hadn't showered. Like it said, please don't wear makeup. I was like, no problem. It's not even an option. I had no Fs to give because I was so distracted by this ice storm. And then a week later, my agent calls me saying, they're passing it on to your audition on to Martin Scorsese. And then when she told me I got it, I was like, cool, I have one line in a Martin Scorsese movie. When am I going up to deliver my line? She's like, Catherine, you're playing Robert De Niro's wife. I was like, (laughs) can you say that again, please? And she was like, you are playing Robert De Niro's wife. You're going to be up there for a minimum of three months. You're playing Leonardo DiCaprio's aunt in this movie. And I was like, I never got a full script. I only got my scenes. Initially, I didn't have any dialogue. Martin Scorsese is the most 
enthusiastic, full of life, master at his craft, troubleshoots in the middle of super complicated setups and like finds solutions, throws out lines. And it ended up being kind of this life-changing experience. It's a true story. It's an important story. It's about the yeah. Osage Indians, uh, the Osage Nation in the 1920s. They were the richest people per capita in Osage County, Oklahoma, because they had these oil deposits. And they were the richest people per capita in the world. And all of these people descended and conspired and... Hmm killed them to try to get their oil rights. And it is a remarkable story. And the fact that we shot it in the place where those events happened, it was only two generations ago. So we interacted wow. with people who were related to both sides of that story. It was profound. I'm going to leave it on that note. I think that's the way to go out here. Thank you for being here and talking to us and again, like teaching us th stories I did not know about, things I'd never heard before. I love you. Same, same, same. And I'm, I'm cheering for both of you. Thank you. Thank you so much to the wonderful Catherine Willis. And guys, that's it for us for episode 10. But please join us next time for episode 11 when relationships are strained, romances are rekindled, and new friendships are formed. Also, Crucifictorious makes its debut. But until then... Clear eyes. Full hearts. Can't lose. Clear Eyes, Full Hearts is a podcast presentation of Cadence 13 in association with Black Barrel Media and Ritual Productions. Executive producers are Stacey Oristano and Derek Phillips, Chris and Mandy Wimmer for Black Barrel Media, and Steve Walters for Ritual Productions. Our producer is Miranda Parham. Send your questions to clearEyesFullHeartsPod at gmail.com. Find us on social media. I'm Stacey Oristano on Twitter and Instagram. And I'm at Derek Phillips on Twitter and underscore Derek Phillips on Instagram. And check out our websites, ClearEyesFullHeartsPod.com, Cadence13.com, and BlackBarrelMedia.com. Thank you guys for listening, and we'll see you next week.